Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Dean's Cup Finals. My name is Carrie Abrams, and I serve as the Dean here at Duke Law School. The Dean's Cup is the law school's premier appellate advocacy competition in which 2L and 3L students engaged with new, engage with nuanced questions of federal law before panels of professors and judges. In an ordinary year, we would all gather in one of the law school's largest lecture halls to watch our two finalists step up to the lectern and present their case. This year, of course, things are a bit different. Nevertheless, we are thrilled to have this year's finalists, Eric Reutemann and Maurice Baynard, ready to engage virtually in a very interesting case before three esteemed federal appellate judges. Judge Morgan Christen of the Ninth Circuit, Judge Barbara Lagoa of the 11th Circuit, and Judge Carl E. Stewart of the Fifth Circuit. We are likewise delighted to have all of you here to support them from near and far. On behalf of the entire law school community, thank you to all of this year's Dean's Cup participants and organizers, to the professors who served as judges in the preliminary rounds, and to each of the federal judges joining us for the finals tonight. Now I will pass the microphone to Moot Court President Zach Kaplan to get things started. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Abrams, and welcome to everyone joining us tonight for the 2021 Dean's Cup. My name is Zach Kaplan, and I'm the president of the Moot Court Board. The Dean's Cup is one of three annual intramural appellate advocacy competitions here at Duke and is considered our most elite. This year's competition saw 24 talented second and third year students compete in the preliminary rounds before being narrowed to the eight semifinalists you'll see on the back of your virtual programs. This year, due to our strange pandemic circumstances, all participants were required to write full appellate briefs in addition to presenting oral arguments. We are proud of all of our competitors and our semifinalists, and especially to our two finalists arguing tonight, Eric and Maurice. We would also like to thank several people for their invaluable contributions to this year's Dean's Cup, including Dean Abrams, our faculty advisor, Professor Andrew Sear, Sarah Emily and the clerkship office, all of the faculty members and Duke Law alumni who helped judge the preliminary rounds and our four Dean's Cup coordinators, Allison Viley, Koff O'Neill, Brennan Clemente, and Carson Calloway, who have spent countless hours organizing the competition over these last several months. Our biggest thanks, of course, goes to our guest judges tonight, the Honorable Carl E. Stewart of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, the Honorable Morgan Christian, of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and the Honorable Barbara Lagoa of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eleventh Circuit. Please find the full bios of each of our esteemed judges in your events program. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dean's Cup Coordinator, Allison Viley, who will provide some background information about this evening's case. Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Allison Viley and I'm a Dean's Cup coordinator this year. Uh, this year's problem is Archdiocese of Washington versus Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, which was decided by the DC Circuit in 2018. In the case, the Archdiocese sought to run an advertisement as part of its Find the Perfect Gift campaign. The proposed ad was to run on the exterior of WMATA buses for the Advent season. It depicted the silhouette of uh, three shepherds, and it was accompanied by the text, find the perfect gift. WMATA rejected the ad under one of its guidelines, guideline 12, which prohibits advertisements that promote or oppose relig any religion, religious practice, or belief. The archdiocese sued and sought a preliminary injunction, which the district court denied, holding that the archdiocese claims were not likely to succeed, and the DC circuit affirmed. At issue for purposes of this competition is whether guideline 12 violates the First Amendment's freedom of speech clause. Eric Reutemann will argue for petitioner and Maurice Baynard will argue for respondent. As a reminder, please keep your cameras off and yourself on mute for the duration of the competition. And for optimal viewing, we do recommend um, hiding non-video participants and dragging the pre uh, presentation slide to be smaller. 
Uh, now, without further delay, we will begin the 2021 Dean's Cup. Enjoy. All rise. The Honorable, the Chief Justice and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention for the court is now sitting. God save the United States in this Honorable Court. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Bailiff. We call the case. The court is ready to hear arguments in this case. Counsel are advised that we are very familiar with the record below in the district court, as well as the proceedings in the court of appeal. We've read your briefs extensively. And so uh, we'd like for you to hone in on your, your best arguments to it. Counsel for the petitioner, ready to begin? Yes, Your Honor. Can you see and hear me okay? Yes, and it's my understanding that you've reserved four minutes for rebuttal, is that correct? Four minutes, yes, Your Honor. All right, you may press ahead. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Eric Reutemann, counsel for the petitioner, the Archdiocese of Washington. A few years ago, WMATA received an application for a holiday advertisement that displayed the words, find the perfect gift, and a link to the advertiser's website. Now, no one disputes that if this ad had been submitted by Target or, or Macy's, WMATA would have happily accepted it. But it wasn't submitted by Target or Macy's, it was submitted by the Archdiocese of Washington, and so it was rejected. Now, that is viewpoint discrimination. This court has held three times that the government cannot use a ban on religious content to exclude religious viewpoints on subjects the forum otherwise permits. And that is what WMATA does here. Counsel, you can... Go, go right ahead, please. No, no. You, you press ahead. You were trying to get in and you were muted. Go ahead. I was. It was my fault. Forgive me. Um, you, you said this is a viewpoint discrimination and, and that it's undisputed that if this ad were submitted by another entity, that would not be a problem. But we look at context. So you're not suggesting that we wouldn't look at the context of who submitted the ad, are you? No, Your Honor. I'm not suggesting that. It's not just right. about the identity. I'm sorry? It's not just about the identity of the speaker. It was about the content. Uh, but viewpoint is a subset of content description. Right. So, so tell me, tell me what's your best shot at why you think this, that this ad uh, should be interpreted the way you suggest and from which perspective should we view that? Is it an objective test or a subjective test? So it's, it's an objective test, Your Honor. Uh, the, I think if, if you take a look at, at the, what the ad says, uh, it, it, it says that essentially Jesus Christ is the perfect gift. That is the genuinely held viewpoint of the members of the archdiocese, that the ideal holiday gift is knowledge about Jesus Christ. Um, now, since that's an ad allowed, or since that's a subject allowed in the forum, since, you know, retailers can advertise about holiday gifts, uh, the archdiocese religious viewpoint on that same subject is that, you know, that, that Jesus Christ is the ideal holiday gift and they should be able to advertise on that. And, and I'm not actually, the legitimacy of the of the view, uh, certainly not. But I am trying to figure out. Uh, so it's a slightly different question. So there's a there's yeah. this ad appears on a bus, and we have in our materials the ad and then what happens and what you would see if you clicked on it. So are are you proceeding now just upon? I, you told me that it's an objective test, just based upon what I would see if this bus drove by without clicking on anything. Is that right? Uh, so, so yes, although WMATA did use also the content uh, of the website that's linked on the ad at times to judge uh, the, the kind of viewpoints that it was, it was purveying. Uh, and hence my question. So what's your position? What should, how should we judge it? So I would say, Your Honor, that if an advertisement displays a link to a website or directs the people who are looking at the ad to go somewhere else, then, you know, the stuff outside the, the four corners of the ad matters as well. Um, and the thing, okay, but can I ask you a question regarding the record? My understanding of the record is that when you clicked the website, the website directed you to the Christmas masses or the masses for um, the Advent season. Is that correct, or was there something more? Yes, it, it linked to a website with the title was "Jesus Christ is the Perfect Gift," and it had information about Mass and, and the Christmas season. And, and and we don't dispute that. That's religious content. The, the thing is. 
under this court's holding in Good News Club, just because a message is overtly religious, that doesn't mean that it only speaks to religion, that it can't talk to others. Uh, can't, well, uh, let, me, let me ask you a question about the um, Salvation Army ad, because my understanding of the Salvation Army ad is that one also had a website, correct? I had a link. Yes, it had a website with religious content. And that, and that content actually was more explicit in terms of its religious, uh, of what was in, contained in that website. Yeah, I would say it was, it was uh, pretty similarly explicit. The website said that the Salvation Army uh, promotes the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, so we, we agree that, that, that they have accepted ads with religious content. The problem is, you know, that, that goes more to the reasonableness issue. They've been pretty well, arbitrary in making this. Let me, in that vein, and let me ask you a different question. As I understand it, you or your side have pretty much conceded that this is a limited public forum. So now having conceded that or acknowledged it, acknowledged it, if you will, doesn't that cabin your argument in some? In other words, which, what's your strong, having conceded that, what's your strongest argument to prevail, either the viewpoint neutrality or the reasonableness or not aspect? I mean, what's your strongest point to get home given that concession? Well, so your honor, I would say that both are equally applicable here and both are equally good grounds to uh, strike down the guideline. Well, counsel, that sounds like I don't want to say the wrong answer kind of response there. That's not exactly responsive. You don't get to put your foot on first base and second base. You got to decide which one you want to be on. So I'm just asking, what's your strongest argument? I mean, you've argued both of them. I'm not asking you to give up. I'm just saying because you can see that it's limited form, definitionally, that means that they can have some guidelines, some restrictions. So within that purview, I'm saying, what's the strongest of your argument to prevail on cert? Is it the viewpoint neutrality or just convincing us of the unreasonableness of it? That's all I'm asking. So I'd say, Your Honor, we started with the viewpoint. Viewpoint is probably the stronger argument here because there is so much precedent uh, from the three cases, Good News Club, Rosenberger, and Lamb's Chapel. And, and we do concede that it is a limited public forum, but even in a limited public forum, the government cannot exclude religious viewpoints on subjects that the forum permits. Now, WMATA seems to take the position in its brief that uh, what matters here is the government's intent. As long as the government doesn't intend to target religion as a viewpoint, but is actually intending to go after religion as a subject matter, then that's permissible. But that's actually an argument that this court has rejected three times. That's the same argument the government raised in Rosenberger, Good News Club, and Lamb's Chapel. And in each of those cases, this court looked past the government's purported intent, and it instead looked at how the restriction functioned within the forum. So it, it looked at the subjects that were allowed in the forum. It looked at the subjects that the religious message in question spoke to. And if there was any overlap, then it was viewpoint discrimination. And the reason that that kind of analysis is required is because religion is a bit unique, as this court recognized in Rosenberg. It's both a subject matter and also a viewpoint, a broad viewpoint that provides perspectives on a number of other subjects. Counsel, is there any other subject matter that is similarly situated where we could say it's both a subject matter and a viewpoint? And none that this court has recognized, Your Honor. Um, right. And so that's, that's one of opposing counsel's arguments, right? Isn't, isn't, isn't it um, uh, fair for us to be concerned that what you're really looking for is a special protected status for this particular type of speech? And if not, why not? So I, we're not looking for a special kind of constitutional status for religion. It's just as a matter of the viewpoint discrimination analysis, because it is such a broad viewpoint and such a broad subject matter, and there's so much overlap, it's difficult to just apply the, the, you know, the standard viewpoint test where you look at what the government is targeting. Well, that uh, sounds a whole lot like you want a unique category for this type of viewpoint, counsel. So yes, it's just, it's not a kind of a special constitutional status. It's a unique category for, as a matter of applicability because religion is both uh, a viewpoint. I don't understand point. that. I don't understand what that, what that means. Uh, I'm asking you whether or not you're asking for a special, uh, special protection, special status that is unique. And I, and your answer is what? So I guess in, it, to that question, the, the answer is yes, Your Honor. It, it, a minute religion, ago it was no. <laughs> a minute ago it was no. So help me out. Right. So, so I just mean to say that it's not that the First Amendment necessarily elevates religious speech over, say, political speech or something like that. I just mean that as a matter of applying the viewpoint discrimination analysis, uh, it, it, we can't just look at what the government is intending to target because you know, religion is both a viewpoint and a subject matter. So in that sense, it, religion is unique here in that sense. 
But isn't it isn't there an inherent tension between the um, in the Constitution between the First Amendment and the Establishment Clause? And isn't yeah. that, isn't that really the the what's what's that issue here? It's it's sort of a tension between the two, and therefore uh, maybe it is unique. But it's unique because there's this tension in the Constitution. Yeah. So, Your Honor, th that tension does make religion unique in that sense. From the freedom of speech perspective, just you know, going to this court's precedent in Good News Club, Rosenberger, and Lamb's Chapel, because religion is both a viewpoint and a subject matter, it's not enough to look at what the government is, you know, claiming that it's targeting. You know, it's not enough for the government to say that it's claiming that it's targeting religion as a subject matter. And, you know, the reason this matters is because for a religious speaker to express their viewpoint on a subject besides religion, they generally need to use the kind of religious content that is banned by a no religious speech rule like Lamont's. So they need to, let's say, you know, for a religious speaker to express her view on, say, contraception. She well, likely let's, uh, let's assume that we determined that the restriction was viewpoint neutral. Uh, what's your best argument that you're entitled to relief um, if we find no viewpoint discrimination? In other words, can you prevail on the RIFRA without us opining that per se there was viewpoint uh, discrimination? So, so yes, Your Honor, even if this is viewpoint neutral, we still think it's unreasonable under the standard that this court set forth in, in Mansky. And specifically, it's not capable of reasoned application. Now, what, what this court said in Mansky is that in a non-public forum, the government has to draw a reasonable line between what's permissible and what's impermissible. And uh, the kind of evolving standards that WMATA keeps putting forth in this litigation to justify its exclusion of uh, the archdiocese ad shows just how unreasonable their line is. So uh, before litigation started, WMATA sent the archdiocese a letter where they said that the reason the archdiocese ad was excluded was because it depicts a religious scene. So it's recognizably religious. Well, if that's the case, then it accepted 18 advertisements from the Salvation Army that on their face invite the public to donate to a well-known religious organization, the Salvation Army. So if- uh, the a charitable event, you know the response, but if you could engage for me, that, that's a charitable cause, it's fundraising. It's not saying come worship with us as was the perfect gift ad, right? There, there, there's a qualitative difference there. Tell me why that's not um, um, a, a sufficient distinction. So, Your Honor, I'd say it, it's, it is a distinction, but it, it's not, it doesn't really clear up the issue. The, the standard that they're setting forth is, uh, at first was recognizably religious. The Salvation Army ads are recognizably religious. I mean, they're from a well-known religious organization, and they invite donations to a well-known religious organization. And really, the problem is, beyond that, that isn't the consistent standard that WMATA has had. Is so, your argument that they're not applying their standard consistently, or is your argument that their standard is um, inherently uh, slippery so that it's subject to arbitrary um, determinations, really as a subterfuge, uh, subterfuge that, that could hide discrimination? So it's our argument that the standard is inherently slippery, and as evidence of that, WMATA kind of continues to change it to try to justify the ads they've excluded and the ads they've accepted. Now, this court said in Mansky that you know, that kind of changing standards throughout litigation is evidence. Uh, well, back, in, back in the history, WMATA allowed all kinds of ads. And so they allowed them all and then they ran into all kinds of problems. So they surveyed their writers and so on and so forth. And, you know, it looks like it was 50 something, 45, but it was a variety of opinions by the, the writers in terms of not wanting to be bombarded with all these new people. People just want to ride, read their new newspaper, drink their star. But, well, I guess you can't drink on the bus, but Anyway, they don't want to be undisturbed by viewpoints. So they make a business decision to try to satisfy their customers. So then they put the guideline out. Now that's a business decision. So what's arbitrary about that? What's unreasonable if the goal is to satisfy the people who use the service as opposed to an outright attack on religion? So, you know, it is, of course, you know, they're free to make the business decisions, but that doesn't free them from their obligation to enact uh, kind of guidelines that satisfy their customers that are also capable of reasoned application. And the problem is here that these guidelines aren't. So after WMATA said that, you know, it was about what was on the face of the ad, then once litigation started, uh, WMATA put forth an affidavit from one of their ad reviewers that said, well, actually the standard is about the religious content on the archdiocese website. That's why it was rejected. But as we already talked about, it accepted a bunch of ads from the Salvation Army that linked to a website that had substantial religious content as well. 
And then when we got here to litigation in the brief that WMATA submitted to this court, WMATA is now arguing that actually the standard that distinguishes the ads that it accepted from the ads that it rejected is actually whether they invite commercial engagement. That's the language in the brief. Well, uh, let me ask you this that I like to ask counsel. Uh, we've heard your arguments on both, I mean, throughout this. Tell me, articulate the holding you want us to come down with from all these arguments you've covered, you know, the waterfront. So what is the specific holding, uh, knowing that there's a split, uh, the Third Circuit and others, we have this one case. So articulate for us the holding that we should come forth with as a result of your advocacy. So uh, on, the, on the viewpoint discrimination front, we'd like this court to hold that uh, this guideline discriminates against uh, or excludes the the archdiocese religious viewpoints on subjects that are permitted in the forum. And so, you know, through a straightforward application of Good News Club, Rosenberger, and Lamb's Chapel, it's viewpoint discriminatory. And then on the reasonableness front, uh, we'd like this court to hold that uh, Guideline 12 is incapable of reasoned application, as evidenced by the kind of evolving standards that WMATA keeps putting forth and the line drawing problems that result from each of those standards. And um, as evidenced by the fact that, as this court noted in Mansky, it's kind of based on expansive terminology uh, like religion, and it fails to clarify that kind of expansive terminology, either with its, its officials, its ad reviewers, or with the public. Uh, the record shows that WMATA actually has refused to give the public any kind of guidance on what, uh, you know, promotes religion is supposed to mean. And so that has created, you know, all the line drawing problems that we're talking about here. Um, and, and it isn't just the Archdiocese ad and the Salvation Army ad. So, so the record shows that WMATA has rejected the Archdiocese ad, rejected seven other churches, or seven, seven other advertisements from churches that, you know, just talk about things like mass times and church locations. But it's accepted 17 advertisements inviting people to donate to a religious organization, Salvation Army. It's accepted an advertisement inviting people to visit a Christian radio station. Um, it's invited, it's, it's accepted those advertisements. A long answer to my question. I was waiting on a <laughs> on a period, but like lawyers, there's no common or semicolon. You've just taken it on to, to Sorry, another. Not. You got a couple of seconds. Give us a concluding uh, declarative sentence. So uh, for those reasons, we respectfully ask the court find in the Archdiocese's favor. I'll be back up to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Oh, he gave us six seconds back. You're a good <laughs> advocate. Thank you. All right, we'll look for you back on rebuttal. Thank you for your good argument. All right, counsel for the respondent, you're up, sir. You may press ahead. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Maurice Baynard, and I'm counsel for the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, also known as WMATA. Non-public forums exist so that states can effectuate the various purposes of the forums that they operate. And this court encourages states to prohibit some speech when the alternative is prohibiting all speech. And that's what WMATA did here. WMATA makes less than 1% of its annual revenue from selling advertising space on buses. And if WMATA were instead forced to accept all ads and all the consequences associated with those ads, WMATA would likely choose to prohibit all ads instead. But this is the exact decision that this court has said that states are not forced to make when operating non-public forums. Mr. Ben, power, Judge, Judge Hardiman wrote a very forceful opinion in the Third Circuit, which disagreed with the outcome below here, uh, what do we make of that? Yes, Your Honor, I'm aware that other circuits have disagreed with the DC circuit here, but I do believe that the DC circuit is correct. And that is because- Well, I'm sure you do or you wouldn't <laughs> be here, but I'm asking you to give us the benefit. I'm saying, you know, the third circuit, you're talking about a very, you know, and the opinion, the issues are very close and so forth, raising similar situations, et cetera, et cetera. And it's out there. And so we granted cert because of, you know, the conflict and so forth. So I'm just asking your best uh, articulation of why either that reasoning is not a, a controlling here or, or, or the other. Um, I mean, that reasoning is not controlling here, but the judge is correct in that in non-public forums, it is sometimes difficult to distinguish between subject matter and viewpoint. The court here specifically noted in Good News Club that when the subject is morals and character, it is quixotic to attempt the distinction between viewpoint and reasonableness. But this, but all of those cases involve forums that had broad purposes of generally promoting community welfare. And this type of broad purpose 
permitting many different subject matters is susceptible to many different viewpoints, including religious viewpoints. But this is not the case here. WMATA has a very limited commercial purpose, which is not as susceptible to all of these wide ranging viewpoints, like the religious viewpoints proposed by the archdiocese. In contrary to the, the guidelines, forgive me, can I ask you a question about this? Yes. Uh, I'm trying to figure out on the one hand, sort of what's left, and it seems to me that advertising, because there are many different um, parts to these guidelines that, that whack, uh, increasingly uh, whack the scope of the forum. And it, guideline nine in particular strikes me as exceptionally broad, right? It prohibits any issue on which there may be varying opinions. Right? Yes, Your Honor, the guidelines- it Strikes me as the ultimate catch-all that would, that would allow um, uh, a very arbitrary enforcement. Do you want to speak to that? The guidelines are very broad, Your Honor. This is intentionally so. In the resolution that WMATA passed enacting the guidelines, they explicitly stated their intent to prohibit all issue-oriented ads. And that's what the guidelines are meant to be. And this itself is not a problem. The Archdiocese concedes that the exact number of prohibited permitted subjects itself doesn't matter. And this- It's not about the number. It's not about the number. I want you to look please at, at guideline nine in particular. And why shouldn't I be very concerned that the next time around, if there's a viewpoint that the transit authority doesn't uh, appreciate, that they'll put it, uh, they'll reject the ad because of this uh, very broad category that allows, seems to me, pretty much unfettered discretion. Yes, Your Honor. So after the guidelines, it is effective that only commercial ads are predominantly going to be permitted. But if an ad is on commercial, any other viewpoint that it expresses is irrelevant. It will be permitted as long as it is on that permitted subject matter. And point what, your what, what is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, could you just take one more try to see if you can answer my question? Why shouldn't I be concerned that guideline number nine allows the transit authority unfettered discretion to reject any ad uh, that expresses a viewpoint with which the transit authority does not agree? Because your honor, it requires that the WMATA reject all ads that fall under that guideline, whether or not they agree with the viewpoint being expressed. It's the subject matter itself. And here are the ads that the Archdiocese points to, the ads like the Salvation Army, the Core Power Yoga, and the Christian Radio Station, they're accepted because they're commercial ads. And since they're commercial ads, any viewpoint on commercial, on that commercial ad will be permitted. Uh, the can fact you define for me what, what, what is the definition of a commercial ad? Here we believe these are commercial because a reasonable observer looking at these ads would understand that the advertisers are seeking to engage in a commercial transaction. They want your money, but this is not the case with the Archdiocese ad. Archdiocese ad is more similar to that for like a political rally. Even though you can donate to the politician there does not turn such an ad into a commercial ad. If this attenuated connection to commerce was all it takes then everything would be commercial, but this is not the case. And the Archdiocese ad is for a religious service. So the fact that you can donate to the church while you're there does not all of a sudden turn this religious ad into a commercial ad. Now this court in Layman v. Shaker Heights, another case involving speech restrictions on a transit authority, there the court cited the lower court improvingly when it said, the city has decided that purveyors of goods and services in commerce may purchase advertising space on an equal basis, whether they be house builders or butchers. And this is all that WMATA did here. It is limiting the content to commercial ads and then anyone expressing any view, as long as it is a commercial ad, they will be accepted. Well, let's say, so let's say if you had a commercial ad, let's say that you had uh, Macy's or Nordstrom's decide to run a Christmas ad. And instead of having Santa uh, in the ad, the depiction was a nativity scene. Would that be uh, a problem under the guidelines? The fact that it also includes an activity seed would not be a problem as long as it is also a commercial ad. If they are still attempting to engage in a commercial transaction, then that would be per permitted, even religious viewpoints. So if you had the same exact ad as the archdiocese that said, find the perfect gift, and you had uh, the, uh, the the three kings, but it was a advertisement by Nordstrom's or Macy's, that would be acceptable to the transit authority? All, we believe that this ad is religious based on the text context and purpose. And if all of that were the same and the only difference is who is publishing it, then yes, that ad would similarly be prohibited. I find it very unlikely that Macy's would put some type of ad like this. They likely would be submitting ads that have much more of a commercial purpose. And if you look at this ad specifically- well, Again, I'm, my question is, if a advertiser that has a, a storefront, whether it's Macy's, Nordstrom's, or let's just say it's a, it's a, a mom and pop store, and they have uh, the same advertisement says, find the perfect gift. And they have the scene with the three wise men looking at the North Star. Um, would that be something that the transit authority would not allow? Um, 
I believe they would not allow that, not knowing any context behind that, it is a little difficult. But yes, this if it is the exact same thing as the Archdiocese ad, just changing who has published it, then yes, I believe that that would also be rejected. So, so it seems to me really that what the opposition seems to be is it, if it has anything to do or depicts anything having to do with religion, period, end of story. That is not the case. Archdiocese also points to ads like the Salvation Army, which they note has lots of religious content. But the fact that it is also commercial makes it acceptable. It is not anything with religious content is not immediately prohibited. If it is on an otherwise permitted subject matter, then it will be acceptable. So then tell me exactly how, why would something with a nativity scene uh, be acceptable, but a scene with the three wise men would not be? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the difference. I think both of those scenes without anything more would both be prohibited as being religious. I see, okay. Would, would uh, St. Mark's be able to um, put an ad on a slide of a bus that says, uh, we're gonna have a Christmas concert next Tuesday, $10 per ticket. Yes, Your Honor. I believe that the Archdiocese could advertise for bake sales or selling anything else, as long as there's some type a, of- A Christmas ticket. concert. Um, if they are selling tickets to this concert, then yes, it wouldn't be any different than any other type of concert. But not if it's a free concert. If there is no intent to engage in a commercial transaction, this would be similar to just a religious service and they would be there would be no material difference between your hypothetical and an ad for a religious service such as the ad issue here. And so the answer is, I'm just no. looking for a yes or no. Uh, then no, then that ad without anything more would also be prohibited as being a religious ad. Thank and you. this court has said in Rosenberger has suggested that religion as a subject matter can be prohibited from some non-public forums. Mm -hmm. In fact, if that were not the case, then Rosenberger, Good News Club and Lamb Chapel would have been decided on those grounds. The fact that the court went beyond that and undertook the viewpoint neutrality suggests that there are forums where religion as a subject matter can be prohibited. And if there are such forums. Say again how you distinguish the Salvation Army, because if we weren't dealing with websites, I sort of get it. But with the Salvation Army, when one clicks on the website, I mean, it goes to the full array and they don't hide the fact that it's a religious organization. They don't hide that fact at all. And they have worship services, et cetera, et cetera. So the fact that the website is there, I mean, is that really a distinction between the orthodoxies and the set when all somebody has to do is click the website to get all the rest of the religious information? Yes, Your Honor, the website itself is not dispositive. It is whether or not it is on an otherwise permitted subject matter. And we argue that the Salvation Army is. So whether or not they're expressing a religious view on that subject matter does not matter. As long as they are expressing, expressing a view on that subject matter, then it would then be permitted. But, but it's, the a really tough, it's a really tough line to draw. And so I was kicking this around with my clerk uh, preparing for this argument. And we, and, we, and we talked about a hypothetical where St. Mark's, I don't know why we kept uh, uh, coming back to St. Mark's, but anyway, that was our cathedral in our hypothetical. Um, inviting people to come uh, on Earth Day to help pick up litter. And they, have, they can have a quote of scripture up there, uh, commanding people to care for the earth. Where do we draw that line? Shouldn't we be very concerned about arbitrary enforcement here? That seems to me to be, if it's quoting scripture, a pretty overtly religious message, but the, but the call to action is to come pick up litter. If Earth Day was an otherwise permitted subject matter, then that ad would be permitted. But okay. I, do not, I do not believe it is here. All Go issue-oriented ahead. ads, and that would be an issue that would be an environmental issue of which there are opposing or opposing viewpoints. And as you noted, guideline nine is very broad and I believe that would be prohibited under that right. guideline. It, it comes back to that guideline nine. Any and guideline nine, I think, is really anything on which there, there's room for dis disagreement in our country right now. Uh, people are finding room to disagree on almost everything. So why shouldn't we be very concerned about that? Even if we find viewpoint neutrality, why shouldn't we be very, very concerned about reasonableness? And specifically, I've indicated I'm concerned about arbitrary enforcement. Yes, Your Honor. The arbitrary enforcement comes from Mansky, but this case is materially different from Mansky. In Mansky, Minnesota was prohibiting political apparel in polling places, but they specifically noted that the only apparel that, that would be prohibited is that ones that have well-known political affiliations and ones with lesser known ones, lesser known political affiliations were accepted. And Minnesota gave no standards for determining what type of apparel was accepted and what type was prohibited. And that's why it was arbitrary in that case. But here we don't suffer from those arbitrary standards. All religious ads are prohibited. So WMATA does not have to use these arbitrary standards to determine what type of speech is acceptable. Okay, but is, is that accurate that all religious ads are prohibited? Because the Salvation Army is inherently a religious organization. All exclusively religious ads are prohibited. 
if they're on an otherwise permitted subject matter, then it is acceptable. But if they're only on the subject of religion, which we believe that the archdiocese ad here is, then it is, per, then it is prohibited. And if we look at this ad's text, context, and purpose, we see that it is exclusively religious and not on any otherwise permitted subject matter. The text, as we briefly discussed, has a religious scene and a, a reasonable observer would recognize this as such a religious scene. The Archdiocese concedes this in their brief and they say that it is true. What about, what about the um, advertisement that was done by, um, I believe it was a, a yoga studio, but it was a yoga studio that also did uh, mantras and chanting. So there are uh, people who believe that New Age and yoga is uh, a secular religion. Yes, Your Honor. The Core Power Yoga is selling a service. They're selling the service of yoga at their locations. And the district court specifically noted that yoga is as distant from the ancient Indian traditions as Best Buy is from Bethlehem. The fact that, but the fact that there is some religious connotation behind that yoga does not change the subject. It is also a commercial ad. And so religious views on ads are permitted. That is what viewpoint neutrality requires. If WMATA is going to accept commercial ads, it has to accept all viewpoints on those ads. But the Archdiocese also claims that WMATA should instead only prohibit those ads that are most likely to incite violence. But this would be viewpoint discrimination. If WMATA prohibits the subject of religion, it must prohibit the controversial ads, like the ad depicting the Prophet Muhammad, which had already resulted in two deaths in Texas. If WMATA prohibits religious ads, they have to prohibit that ad, but also they have to prohibit the more benign ads on the other side of the spectrum, which would include the Archdiocese ad. Let me ask you this. What, if anything, in the Archdiocese proposed ad could have been excised or modified, in your view, such that you would have run it? Is there anything, or would they have totally had to push the commercial speech aspect of it? You understand my question? Yes, Your Honor. And we believe they would have had to push the commercial aspect. Specifically, when WMATA initially rejected the Archdiocese ad, they followed up by saying that if the Archdiocese could add some type of commercial objective, then the ad would be acceptable. But the Archdiocese responded saying that they did not see a way to add such an objective, given the explicitly religious purpose behind the ad. They effectively thought that some type of commercial objective would detract from its ultimate religious goal. And so they are conceding that not only was this ad not intended to be commercial, it is not only is it not commercial, but it was not intending to be commercial as well. Also, do you want to re respond to opposing counsel's argument that the transfer authority seemed to give different reasons as it rolled out and that reasons seem to, to shift? Yes, Your Honor, I do not believe that the WMATA has changed its reasons. WMATA has always said that on its face, this is a religious ad and it would be prohibited under that standard. But if this court does not believe that it is facially religious, then going forward, context further clears up this ambiguity. And the website is only one part of this context. There is much, there is lots do of other agree, context around this. Do you agree that we should judge the ad from an objective standard? Yes, Your Honor. So it doesn't matter what the archdiocese intended to convey. That's what I'm understanding. Uh, your, your impression is what would a reasonable observer understand uh, looking at the ad? Is that it? Correct. The Archdiocese's purpose is not dispositive, but we think it is illuminating here. But looking okay, at the so context, I have another question, and okay. that is: Should I just should I should I assess this based upon the ad as I see on the side of the bus driving down the street, or what about one what uh, about what, what what I would see if I were to click inside the ad, click on the link? So we believe that you should judge this ad based on just what you see on the bus going down the street. We believe that it is facially religious, that there is no commercial objective or any otherwise permitted subject matter, and this is clear from its face. But if this court believes that there is some ambiguity on its face, then the context further clears up any of this ambiguity. And this court has noted that context does matter in constitutional law. And here there is a lot of context surrounding this ad. For one, it is only one part of a larger campaign of different ads spread throughout the metropolitan area. For one, the Archdiocese has an ad on transit shelters where people are waiting for buses, which includes the exact same scene, the exact same text, find the perfect diff, plus additional quotes to the Bible. Can I interrupt you, please? If we look at the context in the way you're suggesting, we start drilling down and really looking at the site. I don't know how to distinguish this ad then from the Salvation Army. That seems to be a really tough uh, spell for you. So could you speak to that, please? Yes, Your Honor. We believe the difference between this ad and the Salvation Army one is that the Salvation Army has a clear commercial objective, and they are intending to engage in a commercial transaction with viewers. And the Archdiocese ad doesn't have any such connotation. And that is the material. One of the archdiocese ads have a link that says, "Help the, um, help your parish give the perfect gift, where you can give money." I believe that if this ad was more clearly 
seeking donations to one of its specific charities, then it would be just like the Salvation Army and then it would be per permitted. But just having those, these uh, charities somewhere on the website does not turn everything associated with that website into a commercial ad. Again, just just, actually, could you hear me factually, if I were to click on that link when it says help, help your parish, help your parish and give the perfect gift, does that take me to a fundraising site? Uh, the link on the current ad did not take you to a fundraising site. It just took you to the Archdiocese basic site and then some other tabs you could donate to the church, but the main tab that it brought that's you- That's what I'm asking. That, that next tab, when, I, when it says help your parish give uh, the perfect gift, is that a fundraising? Is, did I interpret that correctly? Yes, Your Honor, they do have some fundraising on their website, but that mm -hmm. is not the purpose of the ad. And you would have to click a few tabs away to even find that once you got to the website. This ad is explicitly, is explicitly a religious ad and not on any otherwise permitted subject matter. And if the court would rule otherwise, this would eviscerate the entire forum-based framework. As this court noted in Layman, it would turn all display cases in public hospitals, libraries, office buildings, military compounds, and other public facilities immediately into Hyde Parks open to every would-be pamphleteer and politician. And the court noted this is not what the free speech clause requires. And now I'd like to briefly move on to reasonableness quickly. Um, this court has already answered the reasonableness question in Layman v. Shaker Heights. That was a plurality decision and it was regarding political speech, but as Justin Christian noted, the free speech clause does not elevate religious speech above political speech. They are afforded the exact same protections under the free speech clause. And in that case, the plurality of this court noted that some of the concerns that are present here justified a categorical restriction on all political speech on a transit authority. Those were concerns with issues of favoritism, allocating limited advertising space, and these types of ads justify the political restrictions there. And these types of concerns also justify the religious restriction here. But in addition to these administrative concerns, WMATA has also identified significant security risks. The Department of Homeland Security and local law enforcement reached out to WMATA about the issues with, pose, with publishing specific ads. Uh, it's specifically mentioning the Prophet Muhammad ad that again had already resulted in two deaths. So these administrative concerns combined with these security risks justify these types of restrictions. These ads were causing problems, so WMATA prohibited these ads. And this is a reasonable determination. The Archdiocese instead claims that WMATA should prohibit individual subjects instead of the entire subject matter. For example, they say we should prohibit just contraception and not the entire subject of religion. But this would be unreasonable to force WMATA to identify every potentially controversial issue and list it on its guidelines. This is more reminiscent of narrow tailoring and strict scrutiny, which is not required in a non-public forum. Here, the standard is only reasonableness and the guidelines are reasonable. And unless this court has any further questions, I'll conclude by asking that this court affirm the DC Circuit. All right, thank you, counsel. All right, counsel for the petitioner has reserved four minutes for rebuttal and- Your honor, can you see and hear me okay? Okay. Got you now, yes, sir, you have a green light. Okay, so I, I'd like to pick up first on the reasonableness point. Um, so it seems WMATA made the argument just now, or Mr. Vander made the argument that really the standard here is all about how commercial the ad is. I, I, the, he argued, that as long as there's any kind of commercial purpose going on, as long as there's anything being sold, um, then the ad is per se acceptable. Now, the problem here is that that's not in their guidelines and that was never part of their rationale until they got here to the Supreme Court. And, and that's the problem. Um, in Mansky, this court said that they cannot have evolving standards like that. And you know, if you take a look at the affidavit in the record of, of their ad reviewer, it had nothing to do with how commercial the archdiocese ad is. It didn't say, that the ad was rejected because it didn't sell anything. It said that the ad was rejected because it had religious content on its website. And if that's the standard, then fine, but it would apply also to the Salvation Army website as we're all talking about. May I ask a question about that? What if we decide they, that they were wrong, that they're not distinguishable or meaningfully distinguishable and the Salvation Army ad should have been rejected, so they made a mistake? Does that mean that we have to decide that their guidelines are unconstitutional? So one mistake, maybe that doesn't mean that their guidelines are unreasonable, but it's the repeated confusing line drawing problems and uh, the haphazard interpretations in multiple ads that present the problem. Um, you know, what this court said in Mansky is that those line drawing problems make something in, make a guideline incapable of recent application. And here it isn't just the Salvation Army ads. It's, first of all, it's 18 Salvation Army ads. 
Then it's also that they rejected, you know, advertisements from churches, advertisements from the Smithsonian inviting people to walk with Pope Francis, but then they accepted advertisements from a Christian radio station. You know, these are the kinds of confusing line drawing problems we're talking about. It's all Council, over. Council opposite in, in his concluding remarks, expanding on the reason was trotted out, these security concerns, et cetera. Uh, you know, what do you say about that? I mean, he says, as part of the reasonable cal reasonableness calculus, they were entitled to take into account security issues and so on and so forth as part of it being, what do you say? So they are entitled to take into account security concerns. That's a reasonable goal, but the guidelines they implement in order to uh, kind of effectuate that purpose still have to be reasonable in light of that purpose. And here, it isn't reasonable to ban every single conceivable religious ad to get at essentially one ad that prevents, uh, presents security concerns in the record, which is this Prophet Muhammad ad. I mean, WMATA could simply just ban ads that endanger the safety of their riders or ban ads uh, likely to provoke violence. Uh, you know, a, a viewpoint neutral advertisement restriction like that would cover the Prophet Muhammad ad only ad they've cited that could present a security concern. And it wouldn't touch all these scores of kind of benign religious ads that have been rejected. In, in their brief, Omada conceded this ad is benign. So, you know, this ad doesn't go to security concerns. The seven ads that were rejected from the Washington National Cathedral, the Remnant Church, like, they don't go to con security concerns. It's unreasonable to ban all of those advertisements to get at this one ad. Um, and it isn't viewpoint discriminatory either for, for WMATA to uh, exclude that one religious ad and accept the other religious ads if it enacts a viewpoint neutral restriction on advertisements likely to endanger the safety of their riders or, or something like that. Um, and, and just as a last point, I'd like to address, Mr. Baynard said that this would, uh, holding in favor of the archdiocese here would eviscerate uh, the uh, forum doctrine. That's actually the same argument that dissenters made in Rosenberger using the exact same language. And the court there recognized that this wouldn't eviscerate the forum doctrine, that religion is both a viewpoint and a subject matter. And so there's a different test. It's been now more than two decades since Rosenberger and forum doctrine has not been eviscerated. And it would not be eviscerated here with the ruling in favor of the archdiocese. Uh, thank you so much for your time, your honors. Uh, I have nothing further unless you have any more questions. All right, thank you, counsel. We appreciate your opening argument as well as your spirited rebuttal. Uh, thank both counsel for wonderful advocacy and the case will be submitted. All rise. All right.
thank you. Um, we first off want to congratulate the participants. Uh, there's a reason why we hear cases by certiorari, and that's usually because they are cases that are not clear cut and have percolated below and that they are formidable arguments and positions on both sides. And that means it's all the more why we appreciate having stellar advocacy by counsel for both sides, both to uh, steer us in the direction of their side, but moreover to answer the questions that we have that we gain from reading the advocacy. So we congratulate uh, both sides for real excellence in developing the problem, your familiarity with it and presenting it. One of the more difficult parts of this is uh, deciding a winner, if you will, of one who prevails, because in this context, it really is picking a, from outstanding presentations by both advocates and our decision as a panel in no way is a comment on the merits of the case as to, you know, which side on that hard legal issue is correct. And it sort of is what it is. Maybe the Supreme Court at some point will grant cert in it when they have a full court and we'll all know what, what the answer is. So, uh, so our decision fortunately is not, we wouldn't be back this soon if we had to decide the merits, we'd still be back there talking, but that's not one that we have to decide. But both of you were outstanding in the advocacy. We uh, have discussed it and so forth. And so we unanimously conclude that the prevailing party, the winner is counsel for the petitioner, Mr. Eric Royton. Uh, we congratulate you on a wonderful job as well. But again, as I said, Mr. Baynord, it's no slight on you at all. I mean, we can tell that you two were left standing uh, tall after a lot of advocacy among a lot of others. And so it's not surprising to us why the two of you are the ones who are left standing to present the argument. Well done uh, by both of you. And we congratulate both of you for a fine job. Thank you so much. Just going to jump in quickly. I have to, for me, given the time zone, this is the middle of my workday and I'm being called to a, a court meeting. So I have to excuse myself here uh, just momentarily, but I want to join my colleagues. Uh, we, um, I'll just speak for myself. I thoroughly enjoyed um, this moot court. I do one or two a year, not a lot, because it takes a lot of time to prepare. I wish I could do more, but I always enjoy them. This one in particular, you both did an excellent job. Um, to have your first argument you know, between <laughs> three circuit judges and you have to do it by Zoom, it's asking a lot. So the good news for both of you is that it's all downhill. They, they, from here, they will all be easier than this, I promise. And you did a, a great job. In particular, you were both very good listeners, really impressive listeners. You didn't speak too fast and you weren't married to your notes. You know, that's what I always worry that people are just, they, they have their speech they wanna tell me. You were really great about taking a step back and engaging and having a conversation with us, which is always, I think the, the, the best indication of, a, of somebody who's really an effective oral advocate, tell me what I'm missing, engage in a conversation, try to help me figure out um, what I wanna do with this case and you're both just supreme. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, both of you did a spectacular job. Uh, you knew, bo both of you knew the case law uh, backward and forward. And I think uh, following up on what Judge Kristen just said, I think one of the most important things for uh, an advocate, particularly somebody who wants to be in court and be a trial lawyer, is the ability to listen. And it could be in a deposition, it could be in trial, but your ability to listen to the questions that are being asked and to the answer are really important because Sometimes you'll have a witness who will say something different than what you thought you were going to hear. And if you're not listening, then you can't do the follow up. And I think both of you did a very good job in pivoting and answering uh, our various questions. And I'm really, really impressed with both of you. So congratulations. And I look forward to you being advocates, hopefully one day in front of the 11th Circuit. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, again, thank you both for wonderful advocacy. I'd love to have you at the podium in the real world there to be able to send you some questions. So hopefully appellate advocacy is something that you'll find 
find your way doing it again, just a, a stellar job. We see lawyers, real lawyers in court and many of them don't perform as well as you did. You both have poise, confidence, being nimble on your feet and especially answering judges' questions. And as you saw, um, it's a hot bench. The judges are well-prepared. And so uh, the ability, as Judge Lagoa said, to really listen to the question that's asked. You prepared so hard and it's very tempting to sort of answer a question you didn't get. And uh, often it is the case, as Judge Morgan Christen said, give me a yes or no answer. Not all lawyers can quickly process, uh-oh, you know, the yes or no. So, uh, you know, that kind of just real time and the ability to pivot on those kinds of questions. And both of you got some questions that weren't softballs and you handled it with great poise. And so, so we, we, we do congratulate you for uh, uh, a wonderful job. And my last comment is just to echo what I said. I enjoyed and participate, participating with both Judge LaGoy and Judge Morgan Christian. We have not met personally. And so it's a funny experience for us. We do prepare as hopefully you saw. So we've learned a lot of law that we hadn't planned on. So it was a great experience. Thank you. Thank you. You're on mute, Allison. Sorry. Okay. And that concludes the 2021 Deeds Cup. Thank you to everyone for joining us. And I hope you all have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. So we got